time ago because we had break in between. <laughs> so like last week, really all you did was come in and take the exam. We really didn't have any kind of lecture. So just remembering the four, four different types of chemical reactions. There's synthesis, decomposition, and then single and double exchange single displacement or replacement. So find in this, find a synthesis, like just which, which reaction in the list is a synthesis reaction. Mm -hmm. Here. So remember with synthesis, you have more reactants, fewer products. So you're taking and combining things. So A plus B making C. What's the decomposition? The second one. Mm -hmm. So the second one is a decomposition because you have more products, fewer reactants, and so you're starting off with something and splitting it. So you're making smaller pieces from the starting material. Single displacement and double displacement are when you have swapping. So there's the same number of reactants and products on both sides. Single replacement is when you take an element in a compound and you make a new element in a different compound. So do you see one of those? Down at the very bottom, there's no, those are both compounds. An element and a compound. Hmm? The first one. Mm -hmm. So the first one is a single. Start off with chlorine and water. And can you see that the hydrogen ends up paired with the chlorine at the end, leaving oxygen by itself? Double displacement, the example with that one is where you have two compounds and then they swap partners so you get two new compounds. But still, two make two, you see one of those. Okay, the last one, the fourth one, both of those. Mm -hmm. So this one would be a double displacement, this one's a double displacement as well. So if you see two compounds and then two new compounds that are formed, but still starting with two, ending with two. So you're not making something new, you're just swapping those pairs. So the why in this is that reactions occur to create more stable products. So products are typically more stable than reactants are, but in some reactions, it depends on the conditions. Some reactions can be reversible. So reversible means that you can have the forward reactants, so the reactants become products, but then there's occasions where the products then combine or form, reform those reactants. So the way that you'll usually see this drawn is it kind of looks like an equal signs with like arrows pointing in both directions. I don't have a font for that, <laughs> but that's what it typically looks like. And sometimes it just depends on the conditions of the reaction. We're going to talk about a reversible reaction. We're going to talk about hydrolysis and condensation. This kind of goes back to the banana lab where we said that plants build polysaccharides and then break them down in ripening. So in building the banana, you're linking things together, but then when the banana ripens, those large polysaccharides break down into sugars. As the banana gets softer, turns yellow, gets sweeter, that's reversible. So that's where you're, you can have reactions going in one direction or the other direction, depending on the conditions of the reactants. So a sort of special reaction is one that's called combustion. So combustion occurs when you take an organic molecule, so remember organic means it has carbon, 
So it needs to be a carbon-containing molecule. It gets combined with oxygen. When combustion occurs, this is very exothermic. So the first one, this is methane. So remember, methane is like natural gas. So if you have a gas heater, it uses methane. If you have city, city gas, that gets piped in. And the gas pack furnace puts the gas together, ignites it with oxygen, burns it, makes carbon dioxide and water and lots of heat. And that heat then, there's a blower that blows all that heat into the house. If it is what they call complete combustion, then carbon dioxide and water are formed. So you take an organic molecule, combine it with oxygen, and make carbon dioxide and water. Very exothermic, methane, propane, butane, octane, like all the components in gasoline, combustion engines, or where you take some type of organic fuel, combine it with oxygen, put a spark to it in order to start the reaction, and it generates lots of heat. There's also a problem that can come into play if you have what's called incomplete combustion. In incomplete combustion, you don't have enough oxygen. So the oxygen to fuel ratio is not balanced. So you can't completely burn the fuel. In fact, when you look at a Bic lighter, that yellow flame is actually incomplete combustion because if it's complete combustion, it would be a blue flame, like a really light blue flame. So that's kind of what you go for if you have a gas stove and you go light your gas stove. You don't want to have big yellow lapping flames off of the burner. You want to like lower it so that you get it's a light blue all around the base of the burner, that's complete combustion. So when you see yellow and lappy kind of like flickering flames like candlelight, that's incomplete combustion. Incomplete combustion ends up producing carbon instead of carbon dioxide. So carbon is soot. When you burn wood, wood burns faster than like most of your other organic fuels like methane. Or... And so there you're going to get the fire, fireplace, the yellow flames of a wood fire. But that's going to generate carbon particles. Those carbon particles rise in that heat that's coming off, goes up into the chimney, but then begins to coat the inside of the chimney. So if you use wood as a main source of heat, then it's required that every year, what do you do? That carbon keeps on building up and building up. That's a fire risk. So you have to clean the chimney, make sure that that gets cleaned out regularly to remove the soot. So if this builds up, this can end up leading to a chimney fire because it's really like small little teeny tiny particles of fuel begin coating the inside walls of the chimney. So you build a roaring fire and it'll actually ignite those particles of soot. Now the other one that's produced is not carbon dioxide. This is CO, which is carbon monoxide, right? Instead of CO2, carbon monoxide, this is an odorless, colorless gas. that is typically made in very small amounts as incomplete combustions occurring. <laughs> When you inhale carbon monoxide, 
it binds to the same molecule that carries oxygen, but it doesn't get released. So in your blood, you have your red blood cells, and that's the red blood cells are responsible for carrying oxygen. So carbon monoxide actually binds to binds to red blood cells and it blocks oxygen from being able to bind. So this is not typically like high levels produced. Most of the time in a fire or any kind of heating source, carbon monoxide will be built, it'll sort of build up slowly over time. So a small amount gets released into the room, small amount gets released. So therefore your oxygen levels don't drop like instantly. Your oxygen levels in your blood start to go down slowly. So as your oxygen levels go down, decrease oxygen levels in the blood, that will make you tired, sleepy, a little disoriented. So you may not even notice it because it's not something that happens in minutes. This usually happens over hours. If carbon monoxide levels build to high enough levels because you inhale it, and it stays in the blood. You inhale more, stays in the blood. So you just keep on inhaling carbon monoxide. It continues to build. It continues to cause your oxygen levels to go down so you can lose consciousness and then eventually suffocate. So it would be the same thing as not getting any more oxygen because this carbon monoxide is blocking this. So this happens regularly that they find in the winter time, people that have like kerosene heaters inside of the house, they don't have good ventilation, they haven't done normal maintenance on their furnace, their heaters, and so they've got carbon monoxide levels, especially if you're talking about like a small house or like a single wide trailer, it's not uncommon for them to find like an entire family that they all passed away because of suffocation, because of a furnace that didn't, hadn't been maintained, hadn't been checked in a long period of time and was generating this carbon monoxide. So both of these happen if there's not enough oxygen. The carbon can be a fire hazard, but the carbon monoxide can really be toxic. Even after that patient is taken out of that environment, they still have to be given higher levels of oxygen. There's other techniques that they have to use to try and get that carbon monoxide out of the blood because it like sticks to the red blood cells. It's absorbed and it, it sticks to the hemoglobin molecules in the red blood cells and it sticks tighter than oxygen can. So it doesn't want to come off. So it stays there really tight. But those are two big issues. Combustion, though, is not a reversible reaction, right? So when you take fuel and you burn it with oxygen, it becomes carbon dioxide and water. You can't reform, so it's not going to naturally, spontaneously reform. Some other reactions that have changes are oxidation and reduction reactions. So oxidation and reduction, this is always when you have an exchange that occurs between reactants. So it could be changes in electrons. So remember when we said that you have, when you form sodium chloride, when you make a salt, the sodium has the electron and it transfers its electron to the chlorine. So in that, whatever loses its electrons, that gets oxidized. So they always say LEO. If you lose electrons, that's oxidation. Metals. always lose electrons when they form an ionic compound because they're always going to lose their electrons. So the metals always get oxidized. By the same token, nonmetals, which have almost eight electrons, are going to have a, an attraction for any electrons. So they will take electrons. So if they gain electrons, that's reduction. So LEO, if you lose electrons, that's oxidation. GER, if you gain electrons, that's reduction. And that's what happens to nonmetals.
they get reduced. So when you form a salt, so just remember in forming metals and nonmetals, metals always get oxidized, nonmetals get reduced. And they form that salt with those ions, those positively and negatively charged ions. The way that they, I learned this was Leo the lion goes grr, because <laughs> of Leo and grr. That was like a, little, like a little saying that I learned as a way of trying to remember what happens in electron movement and identification. So if you see anything like, so if you have this, potassium plus oxygen makes K2O, okay? Metal plus a non-metal making an ionic compound. If you see that, then you know that the metal is going to be the one that gets oxidized. The non-metal is the one that's going to get reduced. So this is the metal, so it gets oxidized. This is the non-metal, and it's going to get reduced. So anytime you see on the opposite sides with the zigzag line, you can identify oxidation and reduction. So the term oxidation came from the fact that oftentimes it's actually seen as a change in the amount of oxygen a substance has. So oxidation is if a reactant gains more oxygen or it loses its electrons. There's a third term that comes into play, and that's if you have changes in hydrogen number. So all three of these can be seen with oxidation. Sometimes you'll see two, sometimes you'll only see one of those. Gaining oxygen, so always think like if something gains oxygen, it's oxidized. Losing electrons like metals, when they become those positively charged ions, that's getting oxidized. And then we'll talk about hydrogen and changes that can occur between molecules in a reaction where hydrogens get swapped from one molecule over to another. So we're either having kind of like transferring electrons, transferring oxygen, or transferring hydrogen. And then reduction is the opposite. So whatever gets oxidized, the other thing's going to get reduced. So reduction is if you lose oxygen, and so oxidation is if you gain oxygen. So reduction is the, the one that loses the oxygen. Or it could be a gain of electrons like the nonmetals get. And you can see it if there is a gain of hydrogen by one substance from another. Whatever gains hydrogen is going to get reduced. So reduced in reduction, oxidized in oxidation, same terminology. So let me give you some examples. Okay, so this is the example of forming an ionic compound. So if you look at the periodic table, remember that when you're looking at an ionic compound, you've always got the zigzag line. So you're always talking about having metal and a non-metal. So if you see that, metal and a non-metal, Metal is always oxidized, non-metal is always reduced because the metal is always going to lose its electrons, the non-metal is always going to gain them. So in this one, find V. Do you see V on the periodic table? Atomic number what? 23. Yeah, so C23. So it's over in that transition list. And anywhere to the left of the zigzag line lets you know that this is a metal. And then O2, oxygen's to the right of the zigzag line. So this is your non-metal. Mm -hmm. So if you see a metal and a non-metal, the metal is always going to lose its electrons. If it loses electrons, that means it gets oxidized. Oxygen is going to gain those electrons. They're going to get transferred in order to form the ionic compound. So it is reduced. So the second one, this is showing changes in oxygen content. So if we look at this, so if we look at C2H6, so that's ethane, right? So that's another hydrocarbon. It's an organic molecule. And so we're doing combustion. This is an example of complete combustion. 
complete combustion because it's breaking down into carbon dioxide and water. So the oxygen content, when you look at this carbon, and then you find the carbon on the product side, do you see that what's happened to the carbon? So it went from C2H6 to CO2. So you would say that it has increased in its oxygen content. So it has gained oxygen. So the carbon has gained oxygen in this reaction. How about the hydrogen? Uh -huh. So the carbon, which was C2H6, in the reaction it becomes CO2. So it goes from having hydrogens to having oxygens. So you could say that it gains oxygen. What happens to the hydrogens? No, hydrogen goes from being part of being bound with carbon to being bound with oxygen. So it also gains oxygen. So this is how you combustion takes a fuel and breaks it down by adding oxygen to the fuel atoms. So both the carbon and the hydrogen of the fuel gain oxygen. So that means that they are an incomplete combustion. Both of these gain oxygen. Both the carbon and the hydrogen gain oxygen. So that would be what? Oxidation or reduction? Oxidation. Sounds like oxygen. Whatever gains oxygen is oxidized. So fuels are always oxidized. Fuels are always going to combine with oxygen. So where's the source of the oxygen? The O2, right? So the O2 is the source of the oxygen. And so the O2 passes oxygen to the fuel. So that oxygen, O2, gets reduced. It goes from being just an independent oxygen molecule to now being combined with carbon and hydrogen. So in the burning of fuels, the fuels will get oxidized and the oxygen is the source of that oxygen. The oxygen then gets reduced. This last one. So in this one, this is a single displacement. So can you see that you have an element in a compound and then a new element in a compound? So iron oxide, what happens to the iron? lost oxygen okay so if you look at it as a reactant follow it to see what happens so the iron loses oxygen what about the hydrogen mm -hmm, that's where it goes so you would say that the iron is what gets reduced and the hydrogen gets, goes from H2 to H2O, so it gets, mm -hmm, the oxygen level goes up. So it's like, kind of like you're looking at how they're paired together. Okay, so initially Fe3O4, the iron loses its oxygen to become just iron atoms. So now it has no oxygen. So that loss or decrease in oxygen by Fe3O4 means that it gets reduced. Hydrogen is what accepts the oxygen. So the hydrogen pulls in the oxygen to form water molecules. And so in doing that, it gains oxygen. And anytime you have gaining of oxygen, that's always oxidation. This, that's not a combustion at all. So it, in order for it to be combustion, it has to be a fuel, an organic molecule, combining with oxygen and making some kind of like carbon dioxide and water if it's complete. So in this one, this is really just like a swapping of oxygen that can occur. The opposite happens, like that's really the rusting of your, of your tools. You leave your tools out and your iron in, the, in your shovel or in the nail, if it gets wet, it combines with the oxygen in the water and it'll form rust, which is Fe3O4. So this is sort of a reverse of that reaction. So when you look at a reactant, you're really like picking out what happens to the reactant? So I always look at the left side and then follow like what happens in the reaction as it goes through. 
So here's the third example. The third example shows changes in hydrogen. So the best example of this is what happens when your liver breaks down ethanol. So ethanol is in any type of fermented beverage that so you're talking about, beer, wine, liquor. So ethanol, CH3, CH2OH, it's a two carbon molecule. So ethanol itself is toxic. So ethanol, if it stays in the blood, will cause damage to cells. So your liver's job is a big filter. So it detoxifies and it does it by using an enzyme. So remember last time we were talking about enzymes. So the enzyme is called alcohol dehydrogenase because it pulls the hydrogen off of an alcohol molecule. So its name, sometimes the names are really nice and they tell you exactly what they do. But if you follow, look at ethanol and look at the product. How is ethanol changed when it becomes acid aldehyde? Uh-huh. So count two carbons on both sides? Yes. One oxygen on both sides? Yes. How many hydrogens in, out in ethanol? Ethanol is CH3, CH2OH, so a total of six. So there's six hydrogens over here. And how many in acid aldehyde? Four. Mm -hmm. So you see that there's only four? So that means that this molecule loses two hydrogen, and it's the enzyme that does it. So the enzyme pulls two hydrogens, here they are, those hydrogens get swapped over to a, a little hydrogen carrier. So if ethanol loses hydrogen, is that oxidation or reduction? Reduction. And the NAD is the one that gains Wait, we have the opposite. So look back. When you gain oxygen, if you gain oxygen, that's oxidation. If you lose hydrogen, so that's what happens to the ethanol. So the ethanol, this is oxidation. It loses hydrogen. Losing electrons or losing hydrogen is oxidation. And this NADH, this little carrier, this is the one that ends up getting reduced because it takes those hydrogens on. Acetaldehyde can actually be broken down and used as energy. So your cells can actually get some use out of it. Ethanol by itself is toxic. So this is why the liver has specialized cells called hepatocytes that actually pull in alcohol and do this. The rate that they do it is also sort of like there's only so much. So if you have a glass of wine, alcohol gets absorbed through the lining in your stomach. So it ends up getting absorbed pretty quickly. So then it's in the blood. And then as the blood filters through the liver, the hepatocytes, which are liver cells, they pull the ethanol out, they pull those hydrogens off, they oxidize it, and then that acetaldehyde can be used by other cells. And they just do this. So they'll pull ethanol in, pull hydrogens off, and then they can reuse it. Pull ethanol in, pull the hydrogens off. Remember how we were talking about how it speeds up chemical reactions? So that's what this enzyme, this alcohol dehydrogenase does. As long as alcohol levels in the blood are not too high, your liver cells can keep up. But they can only do this. There is like a limit. So they can't, they can't go but so fast. They're going to bring it in, they're going to help break it down, and then they can do it over and over and over again. So when people have high levels of alcohol in the blood, then the, F, the enzymes can't keep up. So they can't keep up, and that means that those liver cells are then exposed to ethanol for prolonged periods of time, and they begin to die. And that's what cirrhosis is. So cirrhosis is because of chronic high levels of ethanol exposure, those hepatocytes, the enzymes can't keep up, they die and convert to scar tissue. And if you look at a cirrhotic liver, it really is like shrunken and it's hard, it has like little knots all over the surface of it and that's all scar tissue. So it goes from being, if you've ever seen liver, like calf's liver, like in the grocery store, it's super dark red, it's, got a, it's a big blood filter, super dark red, but it's really soft and sort of flexible before you cook it. But what happens with somebody that has cirrhosis is that liver starts to shrink and it starts to get these hard scar tissue pieces in it. And then what's gonna happen in terms of filtering? 
It's not going to filter very well because you've like scarred up the filters and so it's not able to do it as well. So that means that ethanol levels in somebody that's the chronic alcohol abuser, ethanol levels stay higher, longer, and cause more and more progressive damage. Unfortunately, <laughs> alcohol dehydrogenase in your liver can't tell the difference between ethanol and methanol. So ethanol is called grain alcohol because you, you get it from fermenting grains, from fermenting sugars. Methanol, this is called wood alcohol. Methanol is a really good solvent, okay? So you can use it because it'll like dissolve paints and you can use it as a thinner for some of your oil-based paints, that type of thing. So it has, because it has that OH, it has some polarity, but it's a good, has this ability to interact with different different um, molecules, especially in like cleaning things off, trying to like remove a lot of greases and that type of thing. So you can make it, it's pretty cheap. All you have to do is take wood and like soak it and then you add some yeast to it and they'll take um, the wood and make methanol from it. But if you drink this, alcohol dehydrogenase in the liver can't tell the difference between ethanol and methanol. They're really only different by one carbon, one CH3 extra. And so if methanol is in the blood, then that the, end, the liver cells begin to pull it out of the blood and the alcohol dehydrogenase, you see that it pulls off two of the four hydrogens. So methanol is CH3OH, four hydrogens, and it converts it to this. So what is that? Yeah, where have you seen that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So this is embalming fluid. So the methanol gets oxidized into formaldehyde. And so what begins to happen is you end up with liver failure, you end up with nervous system failure, all because now you've got like an embalming fluid, like a preservative that's being produced in the liver as long as it's functional. So this used to be a problem during prohibition. So during prohibition, people would have their own stills at home. And so maybe they didn't really like know all about like the chemistry of this. <laughs> and so instead of just using pure grain like corn and making your mash from that in order to do fermentation, they may end up with wood products that would get added in. People that were selling bootleg alcohol would actually spike their ethanol with methanol because it was so cheap. So you could take and like mix some of it in. So you're always worried about like this, this whole health issue that was going along all because of the fact that alcohol dehydrogenase doesn't care which one it is. It does both. It'll break both of them down. It'll oxidize both of them, but can cause a lot of problems in the meantime. Okay. So when looking at this in oxidation, this is what you're going to see. If you have a metal as the reactant, then you know it's going to lose electrons. That's oxidation. If you have a fuel, so whenever you see fuels in combustion, then you know that that fuel is going to get oxidized. Because it's going to gain oxygen. And then in the last one, in single replacement or single displacement types of re reactions, So whatever the reaction is, if oxygen's in that, and so in this one, X and Y could be anything. It could be any element in here. So in the first one, you see that X is combined with oxygen, but in the second one, you see that oxygen got swapped over to Y. So here, you would say that X loses oxygen, 
you would say that Y gains oxygen. So in a single replacement, this is the most common time that you'll see, is you'll have like a metal in a compound, and then it'll swap and you'll get a new metal in a different compound. If oxygen's the one that's getting swapped back and forth, that's an oxidation reduction reaction. So which one of those is getting oxidized? Is the X or the Y? Y. So see how the Y on the left becomes YO? So the Y is the one that is gaining oxygen. So that's what you can look for. You may also see hydrogen being the one that gets swapped in a single in a single displacement type of reaction where you have an element in the compound. If hydrogen's the one that's in there that's going to get swapped from one side to the other side. So in this one, and here, X, what happens to X? It loses, mm -hmm. it loses hydrogen. And if you lose hydrogen, that's oxidation. So look, if you look at a reaction, and these will really be like the three examples that I'll give you, is it'll be like a single displacement and either oxygen's getting swapped between them or hydrogen will get swapped between them, or it's a combustion, or it's just forming a salt, an ionic compound. Those are really the most common types of oxidation reduction reactions that you'll see. So then on the opposite side, so let's change the color, looking at those above reduction. So if it's reduction, when looking at metals and nonmetals, what gets reduced? Non it's that nonmetal. Mm -hmm. So if the nonmetal has the reactant, it is going to gain electrons. That's reduction. So that's when you form the ionic compound. Sodium plus chlorine makes sodium chloride. Metal plus a nonmetal makes that ionic compound, so the nonmetal is going to get reduced. In a combustion reaction, what's the source of the oxygen? As we said, fuels, they gain the oxygen, so the other reactant is always just O2, right? So it's a fuel plus oxygen to make carbon dioxide and water. So this is the source, the source of the oxygen for the fuel to help break it down, releasing the chemical energy in the organic fuel. So the oxygen gets reduced in a combustion reaction. The fuel always gets oxidized. And then looking at those two single displacement reactions above, What happens to XO to X? It mm -hmm. So it loses oxygen. That is reduced. And what about the one at the bottom? So Y goes to HY. So Y gains hydrogen. And that's reduction. So we'll do some more examples of these. Not every reaction is an oxidation reduction. These are really like the three best examples. The forming an ionic compound, combustion reactions, and then the single displacement reactions. We'll go through more of them just to kind of practice and pick them out. So this one. Mg plus N2 makes Mg3N2. So one, you see it's a synthesis reaction, right? So it's synthesis, it's not combustion. So magnesium is where? It's a metal, nitrogen is? Non-metal. So remember, if you look at the reaction, if it's synthesis, and you see metal and non-metal, then you know that this is going to involve transfer of electrons. So what gets oxidized? No. Mm -hmm. What gets reduced? Mm -hmm. 
okay? So we'll give the second one, single displacement. Calcium plus water makes calcium oxide and hydrogen. So what happens to the calcium? So that means it is oxidized. So you find, look at the, the starting material and then look at what happens to it in the reaction. So do you see that calcium is now calcium oxide? So calcium has gained oxygen, calcium is oxidized. That means that the source of the <coughs> oxygen must come from? Mm -hmm. From the water, okay? So notice here, H2O then ends up being just H2. So that means the water loses the oxygen. Mm -hmm. So that means it is reduced. So they're always like paired together. So you look at the two reactants and figure out, okay, what gets swapped? Do we get a swapping of electrons, a swapping of hydrogen, or a swapping of oxygen? So what happened in this one happens to chlorine? Yep, so that means, yeah, so losing electrons, losing hydrogen, that's oxidation. Okay, so remember it goes along, hydrogens go along with electrons. Losing electrons, losing hydrogen, or gaining oxygen is oxidation. So this one, the chlorine, gains hydrogen, so that means it is reduced. The water uh -huh, loses hydrogen, so it is mm -hmm, So those are like the criteria. Losing electrons, losing hydrogen, or gaining oxygen, that's all considered oxidation. So therefore, reduction's the opposite. Reduction is gonna be gaining electrons, gaining hydrogen, or losing oxygen. So what about this one? Where's SN? It's empty. Mm -hmm. So it is a? Metal, so this is always. Mm -hmm. So the metal always gets oxidized if it's forming a ionic compound. Chlorine is the, mm -hmm. it's the non-metal and gets reduced. So this is like we're looking at the reactants and just seeing how do they swap electrons, hydrogen, or oxygen in a reaction. So I'll give you a couple more of these, just but they're gonna stay this way. Like they'll either be a synthesis reaction with a metal and a non-metal, or they'll be single replacement ones where they're swapping hydrogens or oxygens, or they'll be a combustion reaction, okay? So those are really like the best criteria of recognizing oxidation and reduction. So the last part of chapter five goes into special chemical reactions that you're gonna see over and over and over and over again in the next couple of chapters. Okay, so it's not something that you're just going to see once. We'll actually talk about oxidation reduction again. It's actually really important in how the body like breaks down molecules by pulling hydrogens off, by moving oxygens around. But in this, when you have condensation in hydrolysis, this is the primary way that you either make molecules or you break them down. So in a condensation reaction, when you think of condensation, always think of making water. Right? So condensation, if the windows, you get condensation on the windows, the windows all steam up. Condensation, you're always going to make water. You do that by removing an alcohol from one molecule and a hydrogen from another. And that's where the water comes from. So an alcohol will get pulled off of one molecule, hydrogen off of the other, and that is going to lead to a connection. So you're going to link molecules together. Oftentimes you're linking individual units together each time doing a condensation reaction. So you can do this and do it again and do it again and do it again. You can end up with a big long chain. This is how you build proteins. This is how you build polysaccharides. This is how you build lipids, how you build nucleic acids, all of the big molecules in the body. If you're gonna build almost always condensation. Okay, so you're going to pull an alcohol off of one molecule, 
and the hydrogen off of the other. That's where your water comes from. H and OH makes the H2O. And so there'll be a little link between. So that kind of looks like an ether. And it really just depends on what else is around it on whether it's an ether or not. So remember, ethers are where you had the oxygen sort of spanned two carbons. So there'll be a carbon on this side, carbon on that side. But this is a reversible reaction because we might need to build big, huge molecules and we can do it this way. So we can just link these and link them and link another one and link another one and keep making a big, long chain. But we also might need to break it down. Okay, so like in digestion, you have to take great big molecules and you have to break them down small enough to absorb them. So remember when we were talking about lactose intolerance and how that enzyme helped to break lactose into the two smaller sugars to be absorbed. In order to break, it goes the opposite way. And so this is really a reversible reaction. We can build molecules using condensation. We can break molecules down using hydrolysis. So hydrolysis, hydrolysis is sort of the way to think of the word. So hydro is water, like a hydroelectric plant. So hydro is water. But when you think of things being lysed, that means to break. So in this, we're going to break a molecule using water. All you're really doing is the opposite of a condensation. So you're going to add a hydrogen. Hydrogen gets added onto the oxygen. And then the alcohol group gets added on to the opposite side. So we can go in this direction, breaking molecules into smaller molecules, or we can go in the left to right direction, which helps to build them up. There's their example. So their example is actually how you can form an energy molecule in the body called ATP. And the way that you build ATP is you have to take a molecule called ADP and you have to use condensation. Here is the alcohol and there's hydrogens that are taken out of the surrounding area and that's used to do this link. To build this connection, putting an extra phosphate onto the molecule, making it bigger, giving it more energy. So ATP, they call it the universal energy molecule in the cell. So you have to take energy to do this. So here, energy has to go in. But when you have ATP, you can use that as energy in order to power the cell to do other things. So in that case, when you're going the other direction, that energy gets released. So we'll talk a little more about that in chapter 12. It'll be a while. But we'll talk about this in chapter six because this is how you link your monosaccharides into disaccharides into the polysaccharides. The last kind of common reaction that occurs are what they call addition reactions. So in this one, an addition reaction is really when you're just adding atoms to break a double bond. So here is a double bond we can add a molecule and break this link. So remember that carbon has four covalent bonds. So in this one, can you see there's one, two, three, four. So that carbon has four. The carbon on the right also has its one, two, and then three, four is the double bond. Carbon always has four, four covalent bonds. But we can take that double bond and break it and be able to add atoms to the molecule in this addition reaction. So you see in this one, you just go from having a double bond to having a single bond, and that means that you're going to be able to add two atoms, one to either side of the double bond. And this happens because double bonds are a little more reactive than single bonds. Double bonds are a little less stable. So it's actually like it's, it's encouraged to form all single bonds. The molecule's a little more stable. So that double bond will break before any of the single bonds will. So depending on what we add in, we can hydrogenate. So if we hydrogenate, we're just adding hydrogen. So looking at this molecule, here is a fatty acid. Remember the unsaturated fatty acids? So those are the chains, long chains of carbon that have one or more double bonds. 
So that double bond here, this is palmitoleic acid, that double bond, notice it's in that cis conformation. So see how the, the double bond angles up? The two carbons stick up from the double bond in that cis arrangement. So what they found was if you take vegetable oil, vegetable oil has a really long shelf life. Like the vegetable oil in my house is probably like three years old. <laughs> okay. Just because like how often do you use vegetable oil? I mean, if you cook all the time, then yeah, but like for a lot of people, like if you go home and look at the little expiration date, it's probably gone past, but it's good for, it's got a good long shelf life. And so that was a benefit. They found though that fats like butter, lard, bacon grease, those are your un those are sorry, those are the saturated fats. The problem comes into play and in the 1950s because butter made from cream, they would churn it in order to make it solid, but butter actually still has like some of the milk proteins. It's not just pure fat, and so it would go bad. And so Butter does not have the shelf life that oil has. So if you buy butter, it's usually about a month, okay? Not three or four years. So in the 1950s, this really actually happened like after the World War, they had extra oil laying around. <laughs> and they're like, hmm, what can we do with this? And so they decided to try to hydrogenate it. So they can take an oil and break this bond because if they break the bond, it will make it a saturated fat. And remember, saturated fats line up nice and tight. They pack in and they can become solid at room temperature. That's what margarine, Crisco, partially hydrogenated vegetable oils like you, the I can't believe it's not butter tub, that is made by doing this process. So you take an oil, you add hydrogen. It typically has to have a catalyst. What do we say catalysts do? Speed they speed up chemical reactions. So platinum is the catalyst. Platinum just helps to bring the molecules together, the hydrogen and the oil together, helps to push them together and break that bond. Hydrogen gets added on this side, hydrogen gets added on that side, and it converts the double bond to just a single bond. So if you look at the one down at the bottom, there's the broke single bond, and then you would just redraw it looking like a normal straight zigzag. So you have the oil that's liquid at room temperature. Once it gets hydrogenated, it becomes a solid. And they found if they could partially hydrogenate, they could make soft solids. So you know that's like the spreadable, your spreadable margarine. They don't hydrogenate it completely because you know butter when you take it out of the refrigerator and you try to cut it, if it's really cold, it's really hard. And then you put it on your toast and what happens? I like tear my toast all to pieces trying to spread it out if I use cold butter. So most people I know that use butter, they just leave it out all the time. But if you don't use it a lot, it'll start getting kind of funky, kind of tart tasting because it'll start going bad if you don't keep it refrigerated. So this is where this came about. So in the 1950s, margarine came out, Crisco came out. They could add butter flavoring to these molecules so that it would have a butter flavor so that it wouldn't taste just like solid grease that you were like putting on your toast. It would have a butter flavor and it really took off and it had this really long shelf life. So you can put Crisco, like Crisco in the tub, like that can, that can be there for like decades, <laughs> like last forever. All it is is just oil that has had the double bonds broken. When they started ramping up this production, they came into a problem. And this was first identified in the 1980s. So in the 1980s, they said, well, you know, sometimes when we partially hydrogenate, we don't actually always break all of the double bonds. Sometimes the double bond starts to open up and then it closes back. And when it does, it doesn't close back in the normal cis. Now it closes back as a trans. So trans, remember cis is when you have like things pointing the same direction, trans are pointing in opposite directions. So if you look at the double bond, the cis should be this way. And in nature, all unsaturated fats have just cis double bonds if they have one or two or three. But under this production, they sometimes would get trans fats. They started doing more and more research about trans fats because 
Remember enzymes. So enzymes help in the breakdown of this, like in the processing of these foods. After you eat them, they get in, they get brought into the bloodstream and then they get processed. So they have yet to find any enzyme that the body makes that can actually break trans double bonds because of the shape. Because enzymes have a really specific shape. Sure, methanol and ethanol can be acted upon by the same enzyme, but the enzymes that break down cis double bonds do not recognize trans double bonds. So they found there was correlation with an increased risk in coronary artery disease. So your coronary arteries are the blood vessels that supply blood to your, to your heart. Mm -hmm. So the coronary arteries. So here's like normal. That's the normal coronary blood vessel. It looks like a tube. Blood flows through smaller and smaller little, little branches and eventually then forms capillaries to supply oxygen and nutrients to your heart muscle. But if it begins to build this, they call it plaque. Mm -hmm. So you start to see plaque build up and they have seen that hydrogenated oils have an increased risk of increasing plaque buildup. So high levels of that in the diet, they've like gone back and forth, back and forth. So finally, there was enough evidence that the FDA in 2013 said, okay, no more trans fats. And so food manufacturers were like, why? Because if they use Crisco or they use margarine to make a cookie or a cracker that they can, they're going to package, it will have three times the shelf life than if they use butter because butter doesn't have a really long shelf life. And so the food manufacturing companies actually had to like even Oreos. <laughs> so Oreos, Nabisco had to stop. They had to actually redo their recipes to come up with recipes that would taste like the Oreo cookie, but not use any of the hydrogenated fats that contained the trans fats. So here's like a, an, an May 2019 in the United States. You won't find any more snack products. You won't find any more cookies or crackers or anything like that that contains trans fats. But it took them six years. And now it was supposed to go into effect on two, in 2018, and they got an extension. But it really, you shouldn't find it. And you'll still see no trans fats. You'll still see that like on labels, but now there really should be no trans fats. All they really had to do is they just had to do a couple extra steps to make sure that cis double bonds either stay cis double bonds or break down into single bonds. And that way you don't end up with any of the trans fats that are present. So there's some of the things like, like the, the Pillsbury biscuits, <laughs> all of your cookies, all of the, and it's really was the prepackaged types of snack food were really the ones that were the culprits. The, the sort of convenience foods. Rice crispy had a problem with that. The rice crispy treats. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And people actually were like, these don't taste the same. Uh -huh. So they like had to keep going back and like retooling the recipe to try and get it so that it tastes like the ones with the trans fats did. Because <laughs> people didn't like it. But really a big benefit of being able to use your hydrogenated oils, shelf life is so much longer. So if you use butter versus using Crisco or margarine, shelf life is going to be a whole lot longer. And it is, with all the little flavorings and stuff that they add, for the most part, has the same flavor. So that is hydrogenation. You can see this. Hydrogenation has hydrogen in the word. <laughs> so hydrogenation is adding hydrogen to a double bond. There's only one other kind of addition reaction to do, and that is hydration. So if you hydrate, you want to drink a lot of water. Mm -hmm. So hydration is adding water to a double bond. So here's our double bond. Just like the other addition reaction, we've got the double bond. We're just going to break it into a single bond and add one of each. The only challenge with this is one, we're adding hydrogen and we're adding an alcohol. So is it random or is it do you always put like the hydrogen on the left and the, and the alcohol on the right? There is actually a rule. You will always add the hydrogen to the carbon <coughs> of the double bond. It has
has more hydrogens. So you add it, you add the hydrogen to the side of the double bond where there's more hydrogens. So if this is, if this is what it looks like, so when you go to add, if you're going to go and hydrate, you're going to add the hydrogen to which side, the left or the right? So you look at this carbon, how many hydrogens does it have? Just one connected, and then this carbon has two. So that means I'd add a hydrogen here, so the alcohol goes to this side. So there was a guy to spend an awful lot his entire life professional life studying this and doing all different kinds of hydration reactions and trying to determine if it was random like how do you know where the alcohol goes how do you know where the hydrogen goes and that's what he discovered is that in all these reactions no matter what type of double bond what other groups were attached it would always be that the hydrogen went onto the carbon that had more hydrogens directly connected to it so in this one the the left carbon it only has one hydrogen but this one, it has two. So you put the hydrogen on that right side. So the guy that did all of this, his name was Markovnikov, a Russian chemist. So he got to name it. He got, he got something ruled after him. So you can see in this one. So the double bond, you look at the carbon on either side of the double bond. And that's really all you're just going to compare is how many hydrogens on this one, how many hydrogens on this one. And it's the hydrogens directly connected. Like you don't care that there's hydrogens on this carbon because that's out there. Okay? It's the ones directly connected. So because this has two hydrogens, I'm going to add a hydrogen to the right side. And that means the alcohol goes on the opposite one. Pretty simple rule. Not too bad. Okay, wait, I have another one. Yeah. So look at those last two. We'll talk about the other ones next time. The last two, okay? So in this one, what are the products of hydrolysis? This should really say, what are, this is not hydrolysis. This should be condensation. I was having a brain cramp, I guess, when I wrote it. What are the products of condensation? So one thing I know I'm going to make with condensation is going to make what? Water. Water. So that's one of them. So in this, oh, no, sorry. It is. Ah, sorry. It is hydrolysis. So I clearly wasn't having the brain cramps that I had. <laughs> so hydrolysis is using water. And I'm going to break this bond. So this right here, this is the ester. That is an ester link. And that's where, that's sort of like the where that oxygen is. That's the weakest spot. All of the others are just carbons connected to other carbons. But where that oxygen is, I'm going to add water. So I can add a hydrogen and I can add an alcohol. So I'm going to do it right here. So to that oxygen of the ester, I will add the hydrogen and to the carbon that was connected to that ester, I'll add the alcohol. So this is, like we'll actually do this in um, soap making later in the semester. But what you end up with is over on this side, CH3, CH2, OH. So that's this part over on the left. And then over on this opposite side, there's a CH3 on this end, then a C with the double bond oxygen, so that's this part, and then connected is a OH. So it just split the molecule here in hydrolysis. We took one, split it in that ester, using water to break it. 
So on a test, I won't ask you to write the products, but if I gave you that reaction, like you should be able to look at it and go, well, that's a hydrolysis. Like I used water and ended up making two molecules. Okay, I took a big molecule, used water to split it in half. What about the last one? What are the products of hydration? So I want to add water. Okay, so look here and look here. All right, so those are the carbons with the two double with on either side of the double bond. Am I going to add the hydrogen to the left or the right? How many hydrogens on this one? <coughs> How many hydrogens on that one? So which side? Mm -hmm. So I'm going to add a hydrogen here. And so what's going to go on that side? The alcohol, the OH. So it would be CH3, CH. OH, and then like really CH3. So that right side would have the hydrogen added. That's a hydration reaction. So again, in, in identification, looking at this, you can see that that's a hydrolysis breaks a bigger molecule into two smaller parts. Hydration is breaking that double bond by adding a hydrogen and an alcohol. And when you do that, you would always add your hydrogen to the side of the double bond where there's more hydrogens. So I'll have more of those. This finishes chapter five. So next time we're going to start talking about chapter six, carbohydrates. And these move along pretty fast because it's kind of like theory stuff. It's not like so much of the math. But I'll have more oxidation reduction examples for you next time. Also identification of hydration, hydrolysis, condensation, and hydrogenation. So I'll give you some more examples of those so that you could pick them out. And that's really, you, you won't have to write the products out, but you should be able to identify from looking at it that that's what's happening.